Well, I think the perception right now is that San Diego State and SMU are going at it like Fred and George Weasley and Harry Potter, but they're actually a lot closer to Professor X and Magneto in X-Men. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On San Diego State. Or, I'm sorry, Locked On Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights free and beloved Conference of Champions. Like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show. Lots to get to today. The San Diego State saga continues a Pac-12 network question, and uh, I got to piggyback off a take from my guy Josh Pate because, well, we were talking about it the other day, and (laughs) that's kind of how the show works. Mailbag is always open here. So the latest development in this San Diego State debacle, for those of you who are not keeping up with the news, as I probably am, but that's kind of how this arrangement works, right? It's your job or at least I hope you feel it is at some level, to tune into the show. And it is my job to give you the news and opine on such matters. So San Diego State has essentially pulled off what it looked like they were not going to be able to do. And that is they appear to have gotten themselves a de facto extension of the timeline for the exit fee that doesn't formally exist, but it does kind of exist. It's there, but it isn't there, right? So the way that it looks from the outside with all this back and forth with San Diego State writing letters and the Mountain West writing letters in response is it appears from afar, like that scene in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire when Fred and George Weasley are too young to put their names into the Goblet of Fire to be in the Triwizard Tournament, And there's an age line that Dumbledore has drawn around the Goblet of Fire. And they think that a little aging potion that is, as they uh, put it, so hilariously dim-witted, or brilliantly dim-witted, anyway, dim-witted is in there. They think that it's going to work. And then it looks like it'll work. It doesn't. And then they start to quarrel. And they look at each other and they say, you said, you said, you said, you said, which is kind of what we've had here with San Diego State. You wrote a letter, you wrote a letter, but then you wrote a letter, but you wrote another letter, you wrote another letter. If you go to the San Diego Tribune, as I think where I I was reading up on all this stuff, there are like six letters or emails or statements that they list out as having gone back and forth. So it looks like they're sparring at each other like that and that everything's very hostile and negative and everything of the sorts. Though the language that's used in quotes in there, if you go and read it, not particularly harsh. It's more of, hey, you know, we have uh, stated our intention to do this. The Mountain West saying we help, right? Like everything is cordial between uh, the Mountain West commissioner and the San Diego state president in the messages that that they exchanged in there, at least as cordial as I I think it it really can be. But it seems like it was generally good natured and that they were both uh, maintaining level professional heads, which is always nice to see because nowadays not everybody does that. So That's how it appears. But the way that it actually looks at this point in time, given this recent article in the news that came out last night, as you're listening to or watching the show, and as I'm recording this show, is that they're really a little bit more like Magneto and Professor X, who if you just look from the outside, you'd say, you two are going to be at odds with one another forever and always. But if you look underneath the surface and you understand the backstory between this character and that character and where they each come from and how they arrived at their particular positions and you dive into it, you actually realize, wait, they're actually good friends. Wait, they could actually work together. Wait, are they working together? Go see X-Men Days of Future Past if you haven't already. Amazing film, by the way. All the prequels, frankly, for the X-Men movies are great, but that one is tremendously good. So is First Class. First Class is like one of my favorite movies ever, but uh, Days of Future Past is tremendous. 
And in that film, you have Charles uh, Xavier and Eric Lancher, Magneto, working together, even though they had been rivals at that point in time, or, or leading up to that point in time, because they had a common enemy. Now, there isn't the same sort of common enemy here for the Mountain West and San Diego State, but it does appear that San Diego State has kind of pulled this off. Hard to say for sure if it's in conjunction with the Mountain West, but boy, kind of looks that way because the uh, the piece wrote that they will there's going to be a board meeting between San Diego or between uh, the Mountain West presidents without San Diego State. Adela de la Torre, president of San Diego State University, will not be there because according to the bylaws, she's been removed from the council given the notification that they're going to leave the Mountain West. But according to the Mountain West commissioner, she said that they will be, quote, discussing San Diego State's membership at a July meeting of our board of directors. That meeting is scheduled for July 17th. So San Diego State and SMU, kind of seemingly in coordination, have laid out a semantical overlay for this entire conversation that allows them both to proceed in any fashion that they want. Because San Diego State writes that letter, probably knowing the Mountain West wasn't going to grant them the extension, which the Mountain West never should have done. So the Mountain West response is, no, we you know, are not going to give you uh, this, that, and, and the other request, right? Like I compare them to Hector Barbosa. They're disinclined to acquiesce to your request, which they were. And then San Diego State comes in with another letter saying, we intend to stay in the Mountain West Conference. But then the Mountain West is saying, no, you stated your intention. And we interpreted that as a formal declaration of leaving the conference. And by July 1st, 2024, you're out of the league and you owe us $17 million. And at this time, we are going to withhold the $6.6 .6 million media rights payout that we owe you right now as the first installment of a payment of that $17 million because you intended to leave the conference. Now, the interesting thing about all of this and this wild battle of semantics here, but it's not really a battle. It kind of feels coordinated because of how perfectly it works out for both sides is it appears at this point in time that either situation can move forward. You could have San Diego State stay in the Mountain West and they could go back and look, maybe there's still, you know, some uh, back and forth or being on opposite sides here between San Diego State and, and, and the Mountain West. And, you know, San Diego State says, no, we never formally left. Maybe that would get challenged in court. Maybe it wouldn't. But the way that this has basically been set up is that the Mountain West declaring we have accepted this intention as a formal resignation from the conference and we are acting as if that has happened, while simultaneously San Diego State has only stated their intention and has not filed the formal paperwork, crossed the, t crossed the T's and dotted the I's to leave the Mountain West, both sides have set themselves up to just be able to go back on whatever arrangement is made and say, yeah, no, this is what we actually meant. Now, if this is confusing, I completely understand that. So I'm going to lay that out a little bit more clearly. What else is clear is that you need to go check out FanDuel because you can take your first swing at betting Major League Baseball on FanDuel, get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. Just bet 20 bucks, you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you bet, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on Major League Baseball than FanDuel. America's number one sports book. Sign up today. Visit fandle.com slash locked on. Get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's fandle.com slash locked on. Fandle, official partner of Major League Baseball.
All right, second segment sip out of the way, ready to continue with the show as always. Lots to get to today. Happy 4th of July, by the way. I should have said that at the start of the show. Happy Independence Day. Hope you all celebrate safely with family and friends. Thank you so much for watching the show on this holiday. Love bringing you that. I will be eating copious amounts of meat and watching fireworks later. Can't wait. So, the way that this has worked out is that both sides can retroactively, depending on what happens with the Pac-12 media deal and expansion, they can both justifiably go back in the court of public opinion, or I believe formally with the Mountain West Conference. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not privy to all the specifics here. I could be off on that sort of stuff, but it appears that they have both set themselves up to be able to proceed with either path. If San Diego State does not get an invitation from the Pac-12, let's say they were to decide to stay at 10 teams or, I don't know, Colorado and Arizona jump and then Oregon and Washington get an invite from the Big Ten and Stanford and Cal, or, you know, whatever scenario could unfold there. Let's say something like that happens. San Diego State can then go back and say, no, 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 no. We wrote before the deadline that we were intending not to leave the Mountain West. And so we don't know anything and we're back in the conference here. Like we said we intend to do that, but we didn't actually do that, right? We never went through the process of doing so. And the Mountain West, contrastly, can accept that written response, but right now they're stating, no, 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 we took that intention that letter of intention to leave as your formal notice to leave the conference, triggering the bylaws, which we began to act upon of, hey, you owe us $17 million by July 1st, 2024, and we're withholding this payment. See how a formal and official that was, right? We knew they were leaving and we accepted it because we started to act in the way that they did. But none of this appears to be legally binding so those situations could flip-flop and both could justify it by basically arguing the other side as I just laid it out, right? The Mountain West could say, no, 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 no. They never intended to leave. See, they never actually went through the process. And then San Diego State, if they do end up getting an invitation to the Pac-12 for 2024, they could then go back and say, no, 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 no. See, the Mountain West decided that we were intending to leave the conference. <laughs> like, this is one of the most hilarious stories I have ever covered. J just because it feels to me that you could have either of those scenarios play out and both sides are ready to act on that, it appears. I've never seen anything like it before. It's kind of a brilliant calculation if I am, in fact, interpreting this correctly, and that's how it ends up playing out. But the quote in there from the commissioner of, of the Mountain West, I believe Gloria Navarez is, uh, is her name. And yeah, that's her name. Gloria, Gloria Navarez, or Navarez, Navarez. She wrote to everybody else in the Mountain West that San Diego State's membership will be discussed at their board of directors meeting, which is scheduled for July 17th. So the Mountain West also doesn't have to have the optics of, wait, why are you caving to San Diego State's request? They can say, no, 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 no. We didn't cave to San Diego State's request. They asked us for an extension. We didn't do that. This is like a workaround. Like whoever came up with this stuff, if this is indeed a joint effort on both sides, this is, it's kind of awesome. I don't know how else to describe it. It's kind of awesome. That is as wild. Okay. Anyway, this question from Molly. Again, mailbag always open. YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore pack 12. DMs and mentions wide open. I have a question. I'll have an answer. If San Diego State gets an invitation with the Pac-12 soon and they wait to 2025, does exit fee drop to 17 million and go up after June 30th each year? You could add a SMU for 2024. They're a very rich school and money is not an issue. 
fact check true, add San Diego State 2025. If media want inventory, Tulane might be the fallback for 2024. I listed that as a possibility on last week's show. Uh, if media want inventory, Tulane might be the fallback for 2024. I would think TV would want to would want a team in Southern California for ratings. I'm surprised the Big 12 did not offer San Diego State an invite at the last minute before midnight. I bet they would have said yes. So I too believe that if the Big 12 had extended an offer right now to San Diego State, they would probably say yes, unless, unless... And this is impossible for me to know because I'm not in these rooms having these conversations. Unless the Pac-12 has somehow guaranteed them that they're going to get an invitation here and that it is going to get done. And then San Diego State would have to assess, do we feel like that's actually going to happen or should we just go over to the Big 12? But the reason I think the Big 12 is landing on not adding San Diego State is because they've just added four G5 schools. And so San Diego State even though they do bring a new time zone, which Brett Yormark has said he wants to add one day and be, you know, a national conference that's in all four time zones. He's got three of them right now with BYU in the mountain time zone. San Diego State as a G5 would be dilutive to uh, the media deal far more than a power five school would because, you know, the ESPN pro rata clause is in there. Rata, rata, forget which one. Anyway, so that's in there which means that ESPN will pay basically a full share for another Power 5 school, but Fox doesn't have that. Now, Fox could, you know, go back and say, oh, okay, yeah, no, we're willing to pay for this or that and the other thing or whatnot. But I don't know that that's something you could necessarily bank on, and I don't know that it would be a full share for a non-Power 5. So I think I understand from that point of view why the Big 12 is not, you know, actively looking at San Diego State as the Pac-12 is kind of, you know, fumbling around trying to get the media deal done and they haven't added San Diego State yet. But the the question about, you know, well, what about the inventory for 2024? If you were going to add San Diego, so, so first, to answer your first question here, does the exit fee, uh, if you wait to 2025, drop to 17 million? Yes, it does. So if San Diego State according to the Mountain West bylaws, wants to leave, uh, right? Like the Mountain West accepted their notice of uh, their, their intention to leave the conference. If they if if they treated that as the formal, you know, rec- or resignation from the league, then yes, because it happened before June 30th, the exit fee is only $17 million. If it were, you know, done after June 30th for the 2024 season, then it would be $34 million. But if they decided to join in 2025 right now, it would only be $17 million. It's the timing there and the dates that come back year after year for, you know, when the exit fees go up and how that that's how the bylaws are structured. So it could be an issue and the American conference is different. So the American conference requires a uh, a 27 month notification to leave the league or else you have to negotiate a higher exit fee. So the base exit fee, according to the American Conference bylaws, is $10 million. But if you're planning to leave the league within a 27-month window, you have to negotiate a higher exit fee. So all the three schools that are going to the Big 12, Cincinnati, Houston, UCF, are going to pay $18 million a piece spread out over the course of 11 years. That's what they negotiated because they notified the conference that they were leaving and they were going to depart within 27 months of their notification of departure from the league. So SMU, right, it doesn't matter, right? That's why I've been talking more about San Diego State because they have these bylaws and the June 30th deadline and everything. The American Conference is different. And SMU, yes, can, pun intended, once again, pony up the money at any point in time to get into the Pac-12. They're ready to do that. Their NIL collective's big, bunch of donors and all that sort of stuff. So they can get into the Pac-12 at any time. San Diego State's slightly more complicated. But now San Diego State, as I've said, is de facto negotiated themselves an extension from the Mountain West, which said they weren't going to, which makes the Mountain West look good, but also gives San Diego State kind of what they wanted. And then we'll see if they negotiate something that's higher than $17 million for, for an exit fee and whatnot. But you wouldn't add a school just to have a 12 team inventory for 2024, you would either, right? Because then San Diego State would be the 13th. You'd have to find a 14th. Do they want to go to 14? Probably not. Who would it be? Eh, I don't know. So if they're trying to stay at 12, then if you weren't going to add San Diego State till 2025, you would either go with 11 
for one season with SMU, or more likely, you'd keep it an even number at 10 for a season, and then add San Diego State and SMU together. Realignment moves are almost always done in, 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 uh, in pairs. You don't see a lot of single moves because it just complicates things from a, things from a scheduling standpoint. So I don't think they would be at 11 for a year. I think they would be at 10 for a year and then add the two schools uh, the following year. So uh, I think that's uh, all the questions uh, in there for, for that one from Molly. This one from uh, Urio637. Uh, whatever. Not a question about SDSU. That's refreshing for some, but about media deal stuff. If Apple or Amazon were to buy out Pac-12 networks, if that's even a thing, could Apple or Amazon potentially use the Pac-12 network's existing linear product to put out their own version of a linear channel to complement their streaming service? Seems that would take care of the linear concerns for the Pac-12 and give a streaming service a new venue for their product, I don't know how this stuff works, so putting it out there for pontification. So my understanding of, of this is that that would go against the business model of a streaming service to have a cable channel, right? So there are entities like ESPN that have, you know, a streaming service or CBS, right, has Paramount Plus or NBC has Peacock. But if you're Apple TV... You want to get people over to Apple TV. That's why you'd be getting into the sports broadcasting space is you want people to pay for the subscription and being a part, like essentially being your own channel, the way the Pac-12 network tried to be, didn't go very well for them. It could have been executed better and perhaps worked to be a part of the cable package, but I wouldn't imagine that a streaming oriented entity like Apple TV plus is going to try and make themselves into their own channel because then you kind of have this bifurcated system of people watching your content and consuming it. And you get, you know, confused on what the brand is and such like the point of, of getting into live sports broadcasting, major league baseball, MLS, perhaps soon the PAC 12, the point of doing that is to get people to sign up for the subscription of the streaming service. That is the whole point behind it. It's why you have movies on that, right? Like it's not, it's about, you know, exposure and money for the conference, but it's just about money for, for the streaming service. And I believe I'm not a media executive, but I believe there is more money in trying to get people to pay you a streaming subscription fee than there is to being a cable channel and being a provider on there. So I don't think that's how it would work. My understanding is that they would remain a streaming only service and that that's where games would go. And that's where sports are already starting to migrate at least at some level, right? Whether that's the NFL playoff, playoff game, the Michigan State Washington game this year in East Lansing, those are gonna be on Peacock and Peacock only. And that's what Apple is try, would be trying to accomplish or Amazon. I still wish it would be Amazon because you have a greater subscriber base. But, you know, Apple TV, uh, if they offer you more money, hey, you might have to go with more money uh, at, at that point in time. But the Pac-12 network thing is interesting because I do wonder, like, is a streamer going to take over all the content, right? Is Pac-12 network just going to cease to exist? Or are you going to be able to watch, you know, certain Pac-12 sporting events on Pac-12 network, Apple, and like ESPN? Are those going to be the three places? Does it stay there? That much is not particularly clear at this point in time. I have heard that a possibility is you, you know, as a streamer, basically buy the Pac-12 network production stuff, like the infrastructure there, maybe put in your own talent. I would take an offer, by the way. I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there for anyone who's listening. You never know, you never know who's listening to this sort of stuff. Anyway, I'm being facetious, but only partially. So that they could take over the the con like they would run the Pac-12 network with the equipment but then rather than it being on Pac-12 network or Pac-12 now the streaming it would just all be over on on Apple or Amazon right and so that way they wouldn't have to go out and buy you know cameras and 
all this all the technical logistics there's a bunch of stuff you know replay stuff and uh, switchers and directors board production trucks like there's just a million million things that go into a, a broadcast there for for that sort of stuff so that's how i imagine it would work okay got to get to this one i was having this debate with with uh, a couple of you last week it was going to be on an earlier edition of the show but lo and behold some stuff happened, yada, yada, yada. Here we are. Now, I'm not going to take credit for what this take sounds like at its outset. I am piggybacking off a take that another individual has who I whose content I very much enjoy. His name is Josh Pate. And he talks about one of the big lies in college football. And I could not agree more. And I'm going to lay this out as clearly and succinctly as I possibly can. The argument that I would, okay, argument is too harsh. The debate I was having with some of you is, are you what your record says you are? There was a quote that was issued from, I think it was Jimmy Johnson, you are what your record says you are. That's in the NFL. This is college football. Not all records are created equal. If you were to go two and one against Oklahoma State, Alabama, and Hawaii, is that worse because the record is worse than going three and zero against a trio of FCS opponents? I I do not think so. Because logic would dictate that that is not the case. Because the caliber of opponents, opponents you are playing in that first trio of games is significantly different than the caliber in the second. But the record is better. And if you are, you're a 2-1 and one football team. That 2-1 and one football team could beat that 3-0 and oh football team by 25 points pretty easily. Because imagine for a moment that you find a team that can go 3-0 and against FCS opponents. I mean, they're 3-0, and and if you are what your record says you are, you're an undefeated team. Um, I'll give you a team that could go 3-0 and against FCS opponents. Let's, uh, let's throw one out there. Boise State, for instance. Let's go with Boise State. Good G5 school in the Mountain West. Year in and year out. Boise, Fresno, pick whichever one you want. I'll go with Boise, just for the sake of argument. So let's say Boise State is 3-0 and after playing three FCS opponents. And LSU this year is 2-1 and one against the likes of Hawaii, Oklahoma State, and Alabama with a loss to Alabama. Again, just for the sake of randomness and argument here, just to make the point. In what world, universe, or multiverse, reality, whatever you want to call it, is that LSU team going to be an underdog to Boise State on any field at any time, anywhere in the world, just because the record's 2-1? and one? The answer is they're not, and they're going to be a favorite probably greater than two touchdowns. But we also remember, I think every day, since this is locked on Pac-12, that this is a Pac-12 podcast. So why don't I use a Pac-12 hypothetical from this very year with what the teams are looking like at this point in the offseason? Is going 3-0... and oh, in conference play against Stanford, Colorado, and Arizona State, is that the same as going 3-0 and against USC, Oregon, and Washington? Mm. No. No, it is not. Because those three teams are significantly better on the whole than the other three teams. And you could have a team that could go 3-0 and against those first three teams, play a team that goes 1-2 and against the other team. Think about it. Let's say, let's, let's take Cal, for instance. We all know I like Cal more than most. Let's say Cal, if they had on their schedule Stanford, Colorado, and Arizona State, which they do, I believe, have all those three games. If they play Stanford, Colorado, and Arizona State, and they go 3-0 and in those games, and Utah plays USC, Oregon, and Washington, and they go 1-2 and in those games, is Cal now better than Utah? Because you are what your record says you are? Or alternatively, 
does context of scheduling matter? What do I always talk about is the biggest problem in college football right now? Scheduling in a number of ways. Now, there are other flaws as well. There are imperfections. There are things that make college football unique and fun. But this notion that you are what your record says you are, I stand with my guy Josh Pate and say, no, absolutely, positively not. Complete and utter hogwash. This is college football. This is not the NFL in which it is set up for every team to have a reasonable chance to be as good as the team on the other side. Financially, draft-wise, that's how it's set up. It's cyclical like that, or at least it's made to be at some level. A win is a win in the NFL. A win is not a win in college football. You are not what your record says you are. You know who started 1-2 and two in Pac-12 conference play a season ago? Oregon State. Well, if you'd just written them off as 1-2 and two against Pac-12 opponents, you are what your record says you are. They're not going to be any good. Hmm, interesting. They did something they hadn't done since 2006. They won 10 games. That was pretty darn good because they were a good football team. They just had a really tough stretch where they had to play USC. Actually, I don't even think they were 1-2. and two. If memory serves, I believe they were 0-2. I'm going to pull that up really quick just so I can make sure that I've got that right. Because if memory serves, they did in fact start with USC, a game that was tragically on Pac-12 Network. They did. And then to Utah. Do you know what they did after that? They rattled off seven straight Pac-12, or I'm sorry, they won six of seven, losing only to Washington. I know, I'm imperfect with my off-the-cusp memory of various team schedules from a season ago. It was a long time ago, okay? They won six of their next seven. They finished conference play six and three. Did you see that coming after they went 0-2? If you just looked at a box score, just looked at standings on the ESPN app and said, oh, they're 0-2. Oregon State is set up for disaster. First thing you should be asking yourself, who did they play? And anytime you see a 3-0 football team that is ranked, or frankly, a 3-0 team that's unranked, that people are saying, oh, well, this team should be ranked. This team should... Mm -mm -mm. Who did they play? That sort of stuff matters forever and always. Oregon State was 0-2. That You could have thrown in the towel on the beeves. 0-2, the 3-0 and start was a farce. They're not any good. They're not going to do anything of note in the Pac-12. Yeah, all they did was, you know, go 9-3, and route Florida in the bowl game, win 10 games, but if you thought they were just going to you know, roll over after that 0-2 start, you just have to look at the opponents. So hopefully we've debunked that. I did the best I could. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. Happy 4th of July. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.